and in unison let us join. Almighty God, you are full of love and tender mercies. Today we come to you in sickness, in distress, full of busyness and worry. We come to you today joyfully and filled with hope and rejoicing. Lord, we ask that you would lead us deeper into our hearts as we join together as one voice worshiping you. In Jesus' name we pray. books, 
There's all kinds of things that God wants us to do in addition to nourishing our bodies, but also to nourish our soul. And that can be through prayer and through reading the Bible and also through doing His work. So not just um, not just spending time in His Word, but doing what He asks us to do, to tell others about God and to do good things for people in His name. Should we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the word that you gave us so that we can learn how to nourish our bodies and nourish our soul, but help us to take that a step further and really do your work and do your will in our lives as we as we live. Let us live for you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Scripture this morning is from the book of John, chapter 4. Verses 43 through 54. Jesus has returned to Galilee. When the two days were over, he went from that place to Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in a prophet's own country. When he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Since they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the festival, for they too had gone to then he came again to Canaan of Galilee, where he had changed the water into wine. Now there was a royal official whose son lay ill in Capernaum. When he had heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, Come down before my little boy dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. As he was going down, his slaves met him and told him that his child was alive. So he asked them the hour when he began to recover, and they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. They realized that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son lived. So he himself believed, along with his whole household. Now this was the second sign that Jesus did after coming from Judea to Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God and all God's people. Amen. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce to you Reverend Dennis Gopal. Good morning. morning. It is good to be here this morning. Uh, say 44 years straight at annual conference is a lot of years. And, uh, and in conference years, that's about 560. <laughs> <laughs> However, there are some wonderful, wonderful aspects of annual conference and spirit sense that is in that room, especially on the day where we have a service of ordering, which Pastor Joy is experiencing in a way this morning that is so significant. The moments from the time she was baptized as a little girl to her confirmation and her call to service, all the studies she's done tests that she's faced through boards and agencies, hard work, love, comes to fruition today, sealed by the sign of the bishop's hands upon her head along with those others that will be surrounding her and community of witnesses. Uh, there is a jolt when that happens for most people. <clears throat> And though my jolt was a long time ago, I still remember it. And I'm so thankful to be here this morning so that uh, many in this community felt more freed up to go down and be with her and that she could be there. Uh, of course, if she isn't there, bad things happen, you know. <laughs> so we're, we're thankful that nothing bad's going to happen in joy. But uh, for your continued service, you should know that she is one of eight being ordained elder this year. 
it doesn't hurt also to know, I didn't include this in the opening service, but there are 28 that are retiring this year. So do the math. Uh, you know, uh, we need desperately for the church to continue to thrive. We need people who are called to serve. There are many ways to serve other than ordination. So if you're feeling a call or sense, you know, a pastor's a good person to talk to, check things out with folks. One of the things that we do best at the local church is to identify candidates uh, for service as mystery, uh, ministry. So your staff parish relationship committee can be a great help there. That's the end of the commercial break. I'm going to start as I did in the beginning service with a place I did not intend to start, but sometimes when you get old, you get free flow of ideas. Can't help it. Blame the aging process. Uh, but I came in this morning, and your wonderful praise band was practicing and doing, I was back there doing the, the senior version of hip hop. <laughs> I couldn't help but notice that the drum set <clears throat> was draped in black cloth and it brought back a memory. It was nearly 20 years ago when I was serving St. Timothy's United Methodist Church in Cedar Falls that so we started a praise band. And they were okay, like your band. They were, they were, they were outstanding. Uh, and uh, back in those days, they did things like they'd take songs like from Three Dog Night or something like that and just change the lyrics. And, and, and sometimes it's amazing the lyrics they changed them to. It truly was. But uh, the long and the short of it is people either really, really liked it. I mean, really, really liked it. Uh, we had them do one Sunday a month, and people would show up in mass, and they were literally dancing in the aisles. But there are people who really, really did not like it. Did not like it at all. Could not understand it. And one Sunday, I came to church and the trap drum set in the balcony of the church was draped in black. <clears throat> After worship, there was a member of the congregation that came up to me and said, well, I suppose you wondered why that trap set was draped in black cloth. And I said, well, the thought did cross my mind. <laughs> and she said, well, when I come into my church and look at that drum set, I feel like I'm in a bar. <laughs> Clearly that wasn't our purpose. And I said, well, I, I'm sorry that's the way you feel. You understand the reason we're doing this, and I know it's something new and new is difficult, is that we're trying to attract people who are very comfortable in a bar. <laughs> but when they come to church and see those two candles on that cross, they feel like they're in a church. And they don't know what to do, and they clam up. And there's no sharing of stories. Afraid to laugh. Do not know what to do with their pain, and so they hold back their tears. And they try to be as still and stoic as everyone else appears to them, because they've learned somewhere along the line, either by being absent, <laughs> or having a bad experience at one time being present, that they're not supposed to be real. Well, I find that to be tragic, which brings us to this morning, because we are on familiar ground. And familiar ground is both a wonderful thing and a terrible danger. It's familiar because we all need roots. We need something to hang on, on, hang on to that we can count to. We need the power and the presence of community and family and things that we know and that we can count on. But in order to live, in order to grow, in order to learn, we need to be stretched. In the Gospel of John, we have Jesus as the spirit of truth. Not a truth that we learn how to stretch, but a truth that stretches us. Jesus as the word made flesh that reveals what real life looks like, that lights the darkness, that gives purpose and meaning.
life is often like a journey. Well, the Beatles called it a long and winding road. Look at that song. You don't always know what's going to be around the next curve. And of course, if the road is very familiar, you might be able to guess. If you're in a windy road, you might know where the deer hang out or the wild turkeys cross. You might know where there's cars often that get congested or the road is free to travel. But every now and then, there is a surprise. A number of years ago, when I was living in Minona, I had a doctor's appointment in Wakan. It was about 20 miles away. 20 miles. Far enough to be not exactly where I lived, but close enough to still be in a very familiar area. So we took a road to the doctor that we were very familiar with. And it was a winding road, a little bit like this one. And as we were traveling that road, we knew so well, I was caught in my common thoughts that I have whenever I go to a doctor. How can I lie convincingly about the symptoms I have that I don't want my doctor to know about? <laughs> I can't understand why my cholesterol could possibly be that high. I mean, I've been eating all the right foods. <laughs> and plenty of them, by the way. How can my blood pressure be at that point? Why is my eyesight not what it was? In fact, I was kind of practicing routine in my head on the way to the doctor so that I would have the joy on the return trip home of saying to myself, why did I even go? I'm fine. You know, Pete? You ever do that? Well, there I had all these things running through my head. My wife, Gail, was with me because, well, Sometimes she doesn't trust me to be on my own. <laughs> and so we're on this long, windy road between Monona and Wakon, and just happened to glance up and to the right and saw something like this. Uh, in a tree in the distance, there were probably, I would guess, 12, 15 eagles uh, that had gathered. Now, in northeastern Iowa, that's not a real uncommon sight to see some eagles grouped in a tree. But what I don't have a picture of, oh, I wish I did. Because a picture is worth uh, a thousand words and it would save a lot of sermon time. One day. But this morning, a word's just going to have to do, and sometimes that's the case. It's a word that has to do. Your grace, a picture and an image of what's possible in life. Gail and I look far to the right and in what had been a bean field that was not yet growing, there must have been over 100 eagles. It was like looking at a cotton field for all the white heads sticking up, and that was just the mature ones, you know, the immature eagles don't have white heads yet. And uh, it was amazing, so, so we stopped the car as slowly as we could and got out. I think we left the doors open so we wouldn't make a noise uh, by closing them, and we slowly walked on the field among the eagles. And they let us get closer than I thought they would before they took off. But you know that hymn, I can feel the brush of eagles' wings. We felt the brush of eagles' wings, and their talons, by the way, are bigger than my hands, I think. Uh, it was an amazing sight. It was actually, I would call it, a glimpse of the grandeur of God's creation. Something that a person would rarely have ever seen in a lifetime and we were blessed to see it. No camera. My wife was along, but I asked you, would you believe her? So I was late to my doctor's appointment. We get there, and of course, uh, it's hard to explain why you're late to a doctor's appointment, and I mentioned the eagles and all of it, the grandeur and everything. And of course, you end up getting questions like this. Uh, who's the president? <laughs> <laughs> what year is it? What is your mother's name? <laughs> now, that actually didn't happen. You know what I'm saying. Because often when you see something that's spectacular and you tell people about it, they smile like they understand, their eyes kind of go back in their head, and they say, a oh, poor man. <laughs> well, 
that's not altogether unlike what was going on in our gospel lesson today. You see, Jesus had been in Samaria for a couple of days, a place that, well, a lot of people didn't think he should be anyway because the Samaritans are sort of the uh, holy other. They uh, worshiped differently. They uh, believed differently. Uh, they were considered outsiders by the inside community in most places. And he had come to Samaria apparently from a festival in Jerusalem that we think must have been a Passover festival since so many of the Galileans that he returns to had been there to witness signs and wonders that he had done while he was in Jerusalem. The book of John actually tells us that Jesus shared many signs and wonders that are not recorded in this book. Uh, and so these are some of those. The ones that are are seven, and I think that it is Joy's intention to cover those seven uh, in the series. So we're on number two today. You may have remembered that sign and wonder number one happened where Jesus is hanging out now in Cana uh, of Galilee. Remember, you remember that one. He, he took the ritual wash water and turned it into really wonderful water. And uh, some of the folks there got a little hung over on that one. And uh, there were other people that probably were precursors to the early, early Methodists that felt that maybe we could use some kind of reverse osmosis to turn the wine back into water. But uh, not to happen. The point was, don't get so caught up in what happened. Get caught up in the power that is available to you by the one who brings those things to bear so that you might have abundant living, that you might know the power in the presence of God. And so we have this ruler that we think was a ruler in the court of Herod, Antipas, Antipas excuse me, uh, coming, making the 20 mile journey from Capernaum uh, to Cana, to see Jesus. He's coming for a specific reason, and it's, it's just <clears throat> eating him up. His son is dying. He has a fever. And there doesn't appear to be anything that we can do with this. Well, you know how it works. You, you think Jesus was his first resort? My, my hunch is, you know, he was, on the, uh, he was on the royal health plan. You know, the one that Congress has. That we're all supposed to envy, but we don't. And uh, so, anyway, he was on that. So he had all kinds of resources of healing that weren't working. His son was dying, and he needed a healer. He heard about Jesus, and he went to Cain. We're not filled in with a lot of details in John's Gospel, which is a good thing, because then we think we understood it fully. And the mystery in this is powerful. But the man comes to Jesus and says, my son is dying, come with me and heal him. And Jesus had just said earlier, even though they welcomed him in Galilee because of signs and wonders, that a prophet is not welcomed in his own country. Why? Well, because everybody's familiar with you and what you say, and if you give a correction or a stretch, sometimes you're supposed to know your place. And Jesus' place was the world, not just home. So the man came and asked him to go, and, and Jesus wasn't going to go. He was going to stay. And the man begged him again, come with me. And Jesus said, go. He lives. We're told the ruler believed and went on his way a word. In John's Gospel, Jesus is the Word. The Word of God that reveals, the Word that sends, the Word that changes, the Word that offers life. And this man believed. Before he got home, 20 miles. I don't know how long does it take to walk 20 miles. For 
for some of us. It's like time at annual conference. <laughs> Takes a while to walk 20 miles. His, his slaves met him on the way and said, Your son lives. What did Jesus say would happen? The son would live. And the ruler inquired, When did this happen? And it was the very hour of the day that Jesus said he lives. We don't know what happened yet. And don't you wish this was a, How many of you remember Paul Harvey before I go on? Or is this just a way? Remember Paul Harvey? Paul Harvey was, and that's the rest of the story, kind of, you remember that? We don't get the rest of the story. It would have been interesting. A lot of people try to fill in the gaps of people who appear in the Acts of the Apostles of who this rich ruler might have been and where he went on from there. But we're only told that he and his household believed. They believed because of the word. They believed that word made a difference. And what they did after that, is an open road. Because you don't know what you're going to face. You don't know what you're going to encounter. You don't know what is possible. An open road. In John's Gospel, we have word. We have word that is enough, that sustains us. We have truth, which stretches us and helps us along our way as we make new encounters. We have light, which opens darkness. And through all that, we have spirit. A spirit that gently blows on the embers of our inside holiness. And makes it a flame so that it has meaning and purpose and can touch others. What does this mean for us? It means when we come here, we come here because we love. We have faith, we trust in God to be in our midst, and we trust those who are we are with as we worship God to share our lives fully. To shed real tears. To laugh belly laughs. To hug freely, to love mercy, to be a people of justice, and to loosen up just a little bit when we are with one another. I don't have to tell you this. Before we even began this morning, Jim and I had a conversation a all, and it's a little bit about this, but the way that we are with one another in our society today, where we draw up sides and dig our heels in and defend, where we wound one another openly because we know we are right and they are wrong, where we have stopped listening, civility has broken down. It is within the gap that comes between right and left, orthodox and libertine, justice and freedom, that Jesus stands, the Word of God, to bring us together. Because Jesus knows that God made us better than that. That we have the possibility of love within our reach. And that that love changes lives. In a word, Jesus says, go, live. Always Jesus' response in the sign, go, live. Whatever the sign may be, if it's the healing of a blind man, Jesus doesn't just click his fingers or rub mud in his eyes and leave it there. He sends them to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. A response in which you find life that can somehow only be experienced, that can somehow only be lived out 
it would be such or easier if we were just written on a piece of paper someplace. And if you had the right piece of paper, you were okay. That's about the dullest thing I can think of. <laughs> God says go. God says live. Feel God's breath on the embers of your innermost being, causing a fire. Helping you to realize that each and every one of you here has a purpose. In some cases, a purpose that only you can accomplish because you are unique and special to God. In some cases, it's a purpose that you must have an other in which to see it to its fruition. In some cases, you must have larger communities still. And we're not all asked to do the same thing because our God is not a boring God. God is novel and new and life-giving, and may you know that presence. It's a journey. It's a journey. A long and winding road. You may not know what comes next, but surely you must know who accompanies you on that journey. Amen. And on this Trinity Sunday, May the power of the Creator, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be in you and with you. May the gentle breath fall upon the embers of your heart, and may you go in search of the abundance of real life along your journey.